finally, we can talk about all the hype. And let me tell you, it sure is worth the wait. AMD Ryzen processors are finally here. What's up guys, Ibra here with Hurricane X, and today we are finally taking a look at AMD's most anticipated processor revival with the Ryzen 7 series launch. Now, I know a lot of you guys are so pumped for the benchmarks, but before we proceed to that segment, Understanding the key basics of this microarchitecture is important. We'll only be showcasing and benchmarking the R7 1800X, which is the current Ryzen flagship CPU, and I'll eventually push that through its paces against Intel's latest and most expensive offerings. Plus, as soon as we get our hands on the 1700 and the 1700X CPUs, a follow-up video will be posted. But before we get into this, a quick message from our sponsor. You can only rely on the pro to do the job, with every keystroke satisfying like the millions before it. Quality feel with every key, regardless of your space. Cooler Master Master Keys Pro, take it with you, make it yours. Let's start off with some incredible achievements with the new Zen architecture. AMD wanted to increase the instructions per clock over the excavator cores by 40%, but the end result is a staggering 52% IPC increase, bringing AMD into direct competition against Intel's Broadwell E counterparts. Expect strong single and multi-threaded performance from the R7 series of CPUs, and that single thread uplift will be key since it was an area AMD's previous architecture struggled in. Spec-wise, AMD is poised to launch an entire lineup right away. At the top of the stack is the 1800X, which is an 8-core processor with 16 threads. These Ryzen processors are actually AMD's first to use a form of simultaneous multi-threaded technology, which allows each core to produce two concurrent processing threads. The Ryzen 7 1800X has a base clock of 3.6 GHz. It can boost up to 4 GHz or 4.1 given thermals are under control. And there's a total combined cache of 20 MB. Those are pretty impressive numbers given it has claimed TDP of just 95 watts compared to 140 watts on the 6900K from Intel. I also have to mention AMD's incredibly competitive price of $500, making the R7 1800X the most power efficient and affordable 16 thread processor ever made. It also happens to be literally half the price of Intel's closest competitor, the i7-6900K. Meanwhile, the 1700X uses basically the same 8 core 16 thread design, but it runs at a slightly lower frequency and it has a lower price of $400. I personally think this will end up being the sweet spot for the Ryzen 7 lineup. Finally, there's the very similar Ryzen 7 1700 with its very sweet price of 329 USD, but its clock speeds may present a challenge for anyone looking for a gaming CPU. Remember, many games require high frequencies for optimal performance, but this processor could be great for larger parallel workloads. One of the most interesting stories behind Ryzen is AMD's Sense MI, which includes technologies like Precision Boost, pure power and extended frequency range. Precision Boost basically allows the processor clock speeds to respond at extremely quick intervals to changes in loads or internal temperatures. Pure power, meanwhile, ensures that the cores enter a low power state when they are needed, which lowers overall power consumption. Speaking of temperatures, if the processor senses that it has additional thermal headroom, it will extend frequencies between 100 MHz and 50 MHz above maximum precision boost speed in single thread scenarios. This XFR or extended frequency range benefits from low temperatures, which means it is extremely important to keep your processor cool. Now, you may have noticed that some of these processors have an X attached to their name, while others don't. That X indicates how far a Ryzen 7 processor's XFR extends. CPUs without the X can go 50 MHz above their precision boost speed, while the 1800X and the 1700X can hit 100 MHz faster. It's also important to note that AMD's Ryzen CPUs are built around the new AM4 platform with a new 1331 socket and DDR4 support. AM4 is not backwards compatible with older generation CPUs, 
but AMD has made sure to build their new platform with future-proofing in mind to support upcoming 7th generation APUs or the Raven Ridge APUs based on the Zen architecture. So expect this platform to last through 2020. This gives motherboard manufacturers an opportunity to create different solutions, starting with the entry-level A320 or A-B300 to mid-range B350 to premium X370 or X300 boards. These motherboards feature the latest I.O. including NVMe PCIe 3.0 X4, SATA, SATA Express, dual channel DDR4, native USB 3.1 Gen 2, and more. I'll be going over the differences between motherboards in another video, so stay tuned for that, but let's just check out this ASUS Crosshair 6 Hero. It has everything an enthusiast could possibly want from a motherboard. One thing I do have to mention is that the Ryzen processor only provides 16 lanes of PCIe 3.0 support. That means, just like Intel's Z270 platform, dual cards will be operating at double by 8 speeds. This is certainly interesting since AMD made a big deal about their support for triple and quad card crossfire setups, but their enthusiast platform won't natively support those. However, motherboard vendors could possibly add PLX lane multipliers for added functionality on their premium boards. Also, take note that if you already have a cooler that has a dedicated backplate which supports the older AM3 socket, AM4's whole offsets are slightly different. Many cooler manufacturers like Noctua and Corsair are offering their clients upgrade kits free of charge. Uh, meanwhile, if your cooler uses the simple clip-on method, it should be compatible. From a high-level standpoint, the Zen architecture uses a simple modular building block called the CPU Complex, or CCX. Each of these CCXs contain four cores, which uses simultaneous multi-threaded technology to process up to eight threads in parallel, and they can be used individually as a simple, high-efficiency four-core, eight-thread part, or combined to make larger, more capable processors for higher-end markets. Meanwhile, individual cores within each CCX can be individually disabled as well without impacting overall performance metrics. For example, Ryzen 7 has two of these modules, while Ryzen 5 makes use of two CCX modules but disables a pair of cores to create a six-core, 12-thread CPU. The possibilities really are endless. Now, before I get into the benchmarks, you need to listen up about Ryzen's memory limitations because they are a bit confusing right now. If you want a full explainer, then click on the link that just popped up to head to our website. Basically, you'll want to buy a memory with a speed of 2667 megahertz or lower or 2400 megahertz or lower if it's a dual channel, dual rank 32 gigabyte kit. Luckily, many memory manufacturers will be launching Ryzen specific kits in the coming days. So with all that done, let's see how Ryzen 7 performs, but let's first start with the test system specifications. As you can see, we are using an identical memory configuration across all platforms, while a Titan X is being used to ensure we eliminate graphics bottlenecks. Kicking off our Ryzen benchmarks with the PhotoWorks test is perfect since it highlights one of Zen's challenges against Intel's competing architecture. While this test may be multi-core aware, like many image processing tasks, it is lightly threaded. This leads to architectures with higher IPC rates providing awesome results. A good example of this is how well the KB Lake processors do relative to those expensive Broadwell e-chips. Moving on to parallel processing workloads and Ryzen is able to truly shine. Meanwhile, it's evident that AMD has baked some very serious cryptography and hashing optimizations into Zen, likely as a result of its ultra-quick caching. As a result, the Ryzen R7 1800X is able to blow Intel's most expensive enthusiast-level chips straight out of the water in the AES-256 and CPU hash benchmarks. Finally, the Floating Point Unit VP8 and Synjula tests once again highlights just how far AMD has come between Bulldozer and Zen. In both cases, performance is nothing short of astounding for a $500 processor. It's awesome. As the tests move into a little more relatable territory, we have a bit of a yin and yang situation. Ryzen obviously excels in Cinebench's and W-Prime's multi-threaded workloads, but it tends to struggle against Intel's KB Lake architecture in the predominantly lightly threaded environment PC Mark utilizes. On the other hand, the 1800X competes very well against and even beats the nearly three-year-old Broadwell E design. Moving on to real-world tasks highlights just how effective Ryzen can be from a price-to-performance standpoint, particularly in Adobe Premiere Pro Media Encoder. Remember, this is a $500 processor that's keeping up blow-to-blow -blow against competitors that costs twice or even three times as much. With that being said, 
even with a tight neck chugging along with the background acceleration, there's still some bottlenecking going around behind the scenes, so the differentiation between these processors is relatively minimal. In many rendering tests, Ryzen 7 1800X doesn't win against the i7-6900K, but its performance is so close to Intel's $1000 processor that they're essentially tied. Once again, we're seeing Ryzen struggle in a lightly threaded photo manipulation task in GIMP, but it doesn't have exclusivity on those performance challenges. The Broadwell E chips, which don't pack in a very specific IPC increases from Intel's Skylake and KB Lake architectures, also push lower than expected results. Honestly, if you're pushing filter-heavy photography workloads in GIMP, Photoshop, or any other similar program, the KB Lake chips represent money well spent. Handbrake, on the other hand, plays to Ryzen's strengths in a big way, and much like Adobe Premiere Pro, the 1800X posts some extremely respectable video conversion times. Rounding out our real-world benchmarks are two very different programs. On one hand, POV Ray represents a very typical rendering environment as we've seen over the last few pages. Uh, the Ryzen 7 1800X provides an awesome platform upon which you can build a rendering station. However, in a program like WinRAR that fluctuates between light CPU workloads and heavily threaded situations, performance relative to Intel's competitors slips a bit. Uh, given the fact that this is a $500 processor, there's absolutely nothing to be embarrassed about here though. And now what you've been waiting for, some gaming. Starting with 3 Mark. When using DX11, Ryzen suffers which is likely due to this benchmark's focus on dual to quad thread workloads, an area where AMD's new architecture seems to have some trouble keeping up with Intel. Switching things to DX12 and its multi-threaded environment sees the 1800X climb back into contention, but oddly enough, the CPU-focused side on the TimeSpy benchmark shows no love for AMD. Its result is within 10% of Intel's i7-6900K, but that's a fair bit off from the 5-15% to wins we're seeing here in some previous tests. Will this hold out into our in-game testing? Let's see. With a mighty Titan X beating at the heart of the test system, I was hoping to eliminate any GPU bottlenecks, but obviously that didn't happen in some cases. When there wasn't any GPU bottlenecks, Ryzen did fall behind its immediate competition though. With its latest patch, Battlefield 1's DX12 API path seems to be perfectly tailored for high-frequency quad-core architectures like KB Lake, and as a result, Ryzen ends up mid-pack, trailing every one of the Intel processors. Infinite Warfare, on the other hand, has a frame rate cap at 125 frames per second, and none of these new processors had much of a problem reaching that level. The Deuce X result came in a bit of a shock to me since I expected AMD to have in-place optimizations for their Ryzen architecture. They were very close development partners with Square Enix on this title. Once again, however, Ryzen fell behind even the 7600K. As for Doom's Vulkan implementation, well, what's there to say? 200 frames per second is more than enough and we're smashing right into the game's engine's frame rate cap. Obviously, more testing will need to take place at higher resolutions, but in those situations, the GPU will influence results much more than the processor. Neither GTA 5 or Overwatch allow Ryzen to catch much of a break, but they do highlight why I repeated time and again that Intel's i5 series processors are absolutely gangbusters in the gaming price to performance category. They may not have all those fancy cores, but their lack of hyper-threading leads to substantially better resource allocation in many games. Perhaps DX12 will change the situation in some way, but right now, buying an 8-thread or higher processor exclusively for gaming is a phenomenal waste of money. Now onto power consumption. The testing here is with a consistently high load from IDA64 alongside idle conditions. At idle, Ryzen's enhanced P-States kicks in and it's able to sip down an impressive low amount of juice. Kicking things up a notch, our load results measure 900 separate log data points to determine a true average power consumption for the system. Here, the Ryzen 7 1800X provided respectable results, but nothing that aligns with the 45 watt TDP difference between it and the i7-6900K. AMD is obviously measuring their TDP values quite differently from Intel. Unlike AMD's official TDP values would have you believe, the winner in a raw performance per watt dogfight between the Ryzen 7 1800X and the 6900K will depend upon the application. From what we saw, both consume about the same amount of power when under full load. One other thing I wanted to point out is just how far AMD CPU's architecture has matured since Piledriver's based FX series. From a performance per watt standpoint, Ryzen is in a completely different league. So there you have it. 
AMD's Zen architecture and flagship Ryzen processor have arrived, and I can't help but be impressed with what's been accomplished. Even with this small single CPU glance into what can be accomplished, it's hard not to be excited about what else can be accomplished with this processor design as it matures. For professionals or prosumers, Ryzen not only leads the charge on the performance front, but also in pricing. The 1800X was able to easily blow with its much more expensive i7-6900K in almost every application, from Premiere Pro to Blender and 3DS Max. In many cases, its performance per dollar ratio is just staggering simply because Intel's pricing is just so darn high. And make no mistake about it, at $500, the Ryzen 7 1800X certainly isn't inexpensive. Just like higher-end Intel processors like the 6800K, 6900K, and even the insanely expensive 6950X, the Ryzen 7 is a relatively poor choice for a pure gaming rig. Yeah, if you want to use it for gaming alongside secondary tasks like streaming or professional work, there's some great value there. However, even today's leading-edge Vulkan and DX12 games benefit from high-speed 4 or 8-thread processors rather than slower 16-thread CPUs. In some cases, you'll actually get better in-game performance from an Intel 7600K than you will from a Ryzen 7 or Broadwell E. Look, AMD's Ryzen isn't perfect, but what it does do is provide a great counterpart to Intel's pricing strategy without sacrificing any performance. If anything, the 1800X has been super excited to see what else is coming from the lineup since a higher clocked quad-core or six-core chip could make for a perfect all-around offering. As a matter of fact, we're going to give the Ryzen 7 1800X our damn good and damn innovative awards for a job well done. While I've come to end this review, this doesn't end our coverage for Ryzen. We already have our hands on with the R7 1700X and 1700, and we're planning a few builds featuring these new processors. Uh, then there's Ryzen 5 and Ryzen 3 launches coming up very shortly. So the next few months are going to be really exciting, and I'm really looking forward to getting my hands on with these new AMD processors. Uh, but let us know your thoughts about AMD, Ryzen, and its performance compared to Intel's offerings. I'm Eber with Harukinux. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.